and I guess I'll get started. So I'm John. Uh, really impressive presentations today. It's really an honor to be included among, among them and also terrifying. Um, but today I'm going to be talking to you about the potential to improve teacher labor markets with market design. So I'm first just going to review what we know about teachers. I'll talk a little bit about kind of some of the current policies we have to improve teachers and the allocation of teachers to schools. And then I'll talk about how little we know about the potential for market design to improve teacher labor markets, but explain why we might think that market design has a role to play in new policies. So first, I'll start with the, what we all already know and the super obvious. Teachers are important. We all intuitively know this if we think about our favorite elementary school teacher or the most influential teachers we've had in our lives, but the best evidence to date also confirms what we already knew, that teachers are important. So in Chetty Friedman and Rokoff's paper, they show that a one standard deviation increase in t teacher value added in a single year increases earnings by $350 at age 28. So that's a 1% increase in earnings, which may sound like a pretty small number, but this is from a single year with a better teacher. So over the course of your education, these effects can compound and be very large. So teacher quality is very important. Teachers are also important for another reason. There are a lot of teachers. So any policy considering teachers and how to allocate teachers to schools or how to improve teacher quality must account for the fact that te the market for teachers is enormous. So if you look in the 2013 American Community Survey, over 5 million people report their primary occupation as being a primary, middle, or secondary school teacher. It's the modal occupation of prime age, college educated adults. So the teaching labor market is big. So let's think a little bit about how it could relate to policies. So an important policy that's been had some of the better evaluations to improve teacher quality is to simplify the teaching profession by making smaller class sizes. So Tennessee's Project STAR was an ambitious social experiment where elementary school teachers and students were randomly assigned to either a small or a large classroom. And Alan Kruger showed that students randomly assigned to a small class had better test scores that year. And then Kruger and Whitmore in a follow-up paper show that these same students in the long run were more likely to take the standardized test needed to go to college, suggesting that they were more interested in going to college. So given this success, California made an over a billion dollar investment in its class size reduction program incentivizing elementary schools to have class sizes smaller than 20. So when a, this wasn't an experiment, so it wasn't implemented in any random way, but Jepson and Rifkin did a quasi-experimental evaluation of this program, and like Kruger and Whitmore, they can also find that average test scores increased when you shrink class sizes. However, and perhaps obviously in hindsight, they found that the class size reduction program had the unintended consequence of making poor and minority students more likely to be taught by less qualified and less experienced teachers. Did so no, they didn't, and that's some of the evidence that I'll, I'll well, I'll allude to later. Um, but in general, there is a lot of evidence suggesting that inexperienced teachers are lower quality. There's a lot of returns to years of experience. Um, but in this particular case, they weren't able to find any evidence that these new teachers were actually of lower quality. Um, of course, there were lots of interactions with the fact that there were smaller class sizes and things, so I don't want to rely too much on that. Um, but this, this impact of seeing poor and minority students being taught by less experienced and less qualified teachers is something we see across the United States. So, on this figure shows data taken from equity reports that all 50 states are required to submit to the US Department of Education to document the inequality or equality in access to quality teachers. So I just picked the five largest states. And the gray line shows schools that have the, it's the top quartile of schools in terms of the percent of poor students at the school. And the red bar shows the lowest quartile of, so you could think of those as the wealthy schools. And across all five states, the gray bar is above the red bar, 
But you see a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of inequality looking across states. And there's some bigger gaps in New York and Illinois in particular. But in all five states, we see that poor students are more likely to have a teacher in their first year teaching. And we know that there are big returns to teachers' years of experience. We see the same gaps if we look at the share of uncertified teachers. Um, perhaps the most striking thing is that Florida has a lot of very uncertified teachers. But if you look at New York, there's a tremendous gap between the share of teachers at high poverty schools that are uncertified compared to virtually none in low poverty schools. And I'm not. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know if. Yeah, I must include, I, I would expect that it does include charters, um, but I, I would have to double check. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but these figures look the same if you look at by high minority or low minority schools. So it's just a reality that poor and minority students are taught by less experienced and lower qualified teachers. So why might that be? So a 10-year-old paper suggests that Nearly 100% of public school teachers are paid based on rigid salary schedules. So similar to other markets that have benefited from market design interventions, teachers are essentially selecting in to their positions, not based on their, the wage of the position, but based on other characteristics. Now I, I was, because Derek's in the audience, I was sure to mention this is a 10 year old paper. This number has almost certainly fallen over the last 10 years as we have more charter schools and there are big reforms to increase pay for performance programs. But still, the vast majority of teachers are paid based on rigid salary schedules that determine your salary based on your years of experience and your education. So, so this is all within districts. So of course, you get big salary differentials in the city of Chicago versus rural Illinois. Um, but in a large city, like sh if you think about inequality, inequality in teachers across the city of Chicago, there are very small differences in salaries across the south side where you're going to be teaching in some of the most disadvantaged areas and some of the better off north side neighborhoods. But what if I went over to the county line or went to Evanston or someplace like that? Do they pay the teachers more? I don't know the salaries, but that's likely the case. If you go to New Trier, which is, or Winnetka, they'll, they'll definitely pay, they'll pay more. So there are across districts, but in many of these large cities, if I wanted to teach in Winnetka, it would be like a 45 minute drive, whereas if I wanted to teach in downtown Chicago, it would be a 10 minute drive. So, and what we find is exactly this. So if teachers aren't valuing, if teacher preferences aren't determined by their salary, what are they determined by? So the best evidence suggests that there are two factors that are very important in determining teacher preferences over positions. The first, like I just said, is geography. So this is just a random map of Chicago. Teachers tend to want to teach close to where they live, and in, they want to live in nice neighborhoods. The other feature that determines teacher preferences over schools is student characteristics. So if you're going to be paid the same, unless you have some altruism or social concern for wanting to teach in a disadvantaged school, most people would prefer an easier job that pays the same to a hard job. So teachers tend to prefer schools with more advantaged students because they have more at-home investments. It's easier to succeed there. Now, another fact, thinking about principals and schools' preferences, is that principals, at least the, the best evidence suggests principals are not that good at predicting who teacher quality. So here's a comic from the United Federation of Teachers publication in New York City. Um, where the principal's asking, I, I see you did well in school, but what real world schools do you have? And tests, I can take tests. Um, so they observe, they observe characteristics, but they don't necessarily know how that relates to how good the teacher's going to be. And the importance of this when thinking about designing teacher markets is that we often want to give teachers a chance to teach and then just make it more difficult to be retained or to get tenure since we're unable to predict who's going to be the best. So Hanushek proposed deselecting, which uh, is a nice way of saying firing, um, <laughs> the lowest performing teachers and replacing them with just average, average performing teachers. And Chetty et al. used use this proposed policy for, to, evaluate, to kind of show how important teacher quality is. 
and find that it could be associated with enormous gains in social welfare. However, Rothstein does simulations accounting for the enormity of the teaching profession. Um, and while he shows that tenure policies are likely to be very effective and actually more effective than performance bonuses, he mentions that they would need to be accompanied by large increases in salaries to compensate for the added risk of losing your job in order to avoid massive increases in class sizes because no one wants to be a teacher anymore. So lastly, and since this is a market design conference, probably most importantly, it's a relatively new area, but teacher, match quality, teacher school match quality is important. So the best evidence we have to date suggests that the quality of the match between teachers and schools explains anywhere from 10 to 40% of what we would normally estimate as teacher quality. So this suggests a potential opportunity to improve teacher quality without attracting doubling teacher salaries, but just by better allocating teachers to schools. So let's consider a simple model in the spirit of Gary Becker of teachers to schools. So let's suppose that there's a better teacher and a worse teacher and a better school and a worse school. So we can assume the better teacher is better at all schools and the worst, everyone's better at the better school than the worst school. So what, what's going to happen? So we know from, from Gary Becker's work in the 1970s that if there are transfers, we're going to get an efficient allocation. So in this case, this would be if teachers are paid based on their comparative advantage, we would get an efficient allocation, which if they only valued their impact on students, they'd be going, we'd be going to the allocation that maximizes student achievement. But as I just said, teachers aren't paid based on their comparative advantage. They're paid based on fixed salaries negotiated, fixed salary schedules negotiated between a union and the school board. So what's typically going to happen is the better school is going to pick based on the teacher's absolute advantage. So the better school is going to say, well, the better teacher is better here. So I'm going to hire the better teacher. And the worst school is stuck hiring the worst teacher. So we get the allocation based on absolute advantage instead of comparative advantage. And I've sort of already said this, but the optimal thing to do here, if we want to maximize overall student achievement, would be to assign based on comparative advantage. Pay for performance policies are perhaps the, the original form of market design in teacher labor markets. I defer to Derek, who's done a substantial amount of the work on this. To talk about this, I'm going to focus instead on the role of assignment mechanisms. Um, and there's a lot of potential for pay for performance to actually improve the allocation by aligning teachers' incentives with their comparative advantage. Um, the only risks of this, which many, most of this has been pointed out by Derek in his work, um, is that it may incentivize inefficient allocations of effort if, for example, teachers develop cognitive and non-cognitive skills but are only evaluated based on test scores that evaluate their cognitive skills. Um, and perhaps more importantly, these policies are often very ferociously fought against by the teachers' unions, which are often a very p powerful political force. Like in the city of Chicago, you may have seen on the news a few years ago that school started a month late because they were striking. So what we're left with is in most American school districts, teachers are assigned to schools based on their absolute advantage. Now, is this a problem? Well, it depends. This is efficient in terms of maximizing student achievement if, based on that old chart, we get the assortative, positively assortative match yields better, kind of necessarily yields more student achievement than the anti-assortative match. What this is really saying is, in the production function for student achievement is teacher quality and school quality, where I'm thinking of this as kind of outs the investments the students are receiving outside of school, are productive complements or substitutes. You can tell yourself easy stories where if there are diminishing returns to investments, then the better teachers might be more productive at the low quality schools. But that's an important thing. You need a price internal or a social welfare function or something that's linear in whatever notion of achievement you have. That's, that's the big unstated assumption on this slide. That the, whatever scale you're measuring achievement in, that the increments at the bottom aren't worth more to society than the increments at the top. Yeah, so you can assume that I've, that these Zs are the social utility units or whatever you want to, to get around that, but 
And, but that would, if anything, push more towards the current as assignment being less socially efficient, um, especially if you think there are bigger gains at the bottom. But this is an open question. I don't, I don't think there's been great research, correct me if I'm wrong, suggests showing whether or not teacher quality and school quality are productive complements or sub substitutes. But another question we could ask is just, do we need the status quo? So we've seen in lots of markets that we can yield better market outcomes by changing the mechanism by which we're assigning teachers to schools. And just because we don't see seemingly troublesome things happening, like schools hiring teachers in their second year of college, doesn't mean that we still can't get better outcomes by changing the mechanism. And if you look internationally, countries like France, Mexico, Turkey, all already use some form of centralized assignment of entry-level teachers. So in, today I'm going to think about what we can do to improve the assignment of teachers to schools by changing the mechanism used here. I, in my head I'm thinking about school districts, but I think it's an open question of what level the assignment should be at. So probably the, the first thing many of us think of when we think about what assignment mechanism to adopt would be the teacher proposing deferred acceptance algorithm. So this would be similar to the status quo. It's, going to assign teachers to schools based on their absolute advantage. And teachers have sort of the incentive of, or have the option to apply to whatever school they want to apply to. And then schools pick their most preferred applicants. One benefit of replacing deferred acceptance with over the status quo is that it's very similar to the status quo, but it potentially substantially cuts the application price of teachers, the search cost. So in Chicago, if a teacher wants to teach, is willing to teach at three different schools, they have to submit a separate application to all three of those schools. If instead, whereas the application is going to include almost the exact same questions, so there's a big time cost. Whereas if they could apply to a centralized system, they could just share all that information like a common application and check the box that they're willing to go to every school in the city, which should weakly expand the applicant pools for schools if you weaken a constraint, you're going to get a better maximum. Um, and there, I'm not the first person to think about the role of market design in teacher labor markets. Um, there has been some theoretical work showing that deferred acceptance may actually be suboptimal if you're including tenured teachers who have kind of an ownership right to their current position. And uh, a recent paper by Combe et al. suggests that there proposes a block exchange algorithm, which for those of you who are familiar with the mechanisms is very similar to top trading cycles to efficiently allocate teachers based on their own preferences. You could think of a school optimal top trading cycles as well. Um, but we saw earlier in teachers' current preferences are driven by geography and student characteristics. We might think, forgetting for a second that principals aren't that great at selecting teachers, that principal's preferences are going to be more aligned with student achievement rather than other characteristics that maybe are less important in our social welfare function, which suggests that there might be some gains from the school proposing deferred acceptance algorithm. So an interesting model here is Washington, D.C.'s Teach D.C. program. So in this program, applicants submit a detailed application. It, it's not just a paper application. They complete a, a, te a teaching lesson. They have several interviews. And then the centralized, the school district sends schools a list of the top applicants, that, which could actually help with their inability to predict teacher quality by being a decision aid where they have experts, they know what, what correlates with future student achievement, and they can recommend this teacher might be a good fit here. So that added information has the benefit of potentially recommending that most likely to succeed applicants. Um, but it's, and it's similar to, this program similar to the school proposing deferred acceptance algorithm. Where, where do the teachers list come from in this? So the teachers apply to a centralized system and then the school, the centralized system shares the list with the schools and then the schools reach out to the applicants. So then the teacher has the ability to- Your application says I'll work at these five schools in this order. So I don't believe they actually asked that now. So it's, it's not actually school proposing deferred acceptance, but it's similar in that the schools are contacting the teachers and the teacher can say, I'm not going to interview here because you're unacceptable um, and collect their offers potentially. Um, 
I'll, I'll keep going because I'm running out of time, but we can, we can discuss this later. Um, the key question, and we just don't know the answer to it because there hasn't been much research, is what is the impact on student achievement and teacher retention? So here I'll talk a little bit about some of my own research. I worked with the Teach for America Chicago region. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, Teach for America is similar to the Peace Corps, high achieving coll primarily college graduates apply to teach in disadvantaged urban and rural schools for two years. Um, so in, once you're accepted to Teach for America, you're assigned a region. So I was working with the Chicago region, but you're also assigned to a grade level. So either high school or elementary. So I worked with them to implement the deferred acceptance algorithm for their high school teachers, but not their elementary, so that we're able to credibly identify the impact I'm going to focus on teacher retention using a quasi-experimental design. And I find that the assignment mechanism matters a lot. So I found a 16% reduction in attrition in the two years they commit to being with Teach for America. It's slightly larger if you look at the first year. Now, this is a bit of an unusual intervention because Everything I've been talking about is sort of taking the status quo where teachers have all the autonomy about where to apply, whereas with Teach for America, they were using something that was much more like the market for new law clerks, where schools had basically dictatorial power and teachers had to accept the offer. So I don't want to generalize this too much to markets. Here you can just see the change in teachers' ranks over what they would have gotten under the old mechanism and the new one, and you can see that teachers were generally getting more preferred matches. Um, but one thing that was nice about this, we sacrificed stability in order to get uh, strategy-proof preference reports from both sides of the market. Teachers weren't allowed to truncate their, strat their li preference list, so they had to rank all schools. So I'm able to simulate the different mechanisms. And I find that, so here I, I just estimate based on the schools and teachers' rankings that how preferred each school and teacher was. And you can see that deferred accept, both forms of deferred acceptance have about the same level of sorting. So once we know the answer to whether teacher quality and school quality are productive complements or substitutes, we can have a sense of whether or not we actually improve student achievement by switching from the old mechanism, which was a little flatter, so there was less sorting, to the deferred acceptance where we get more sorting. So to conclude, while this is a relatively, working in teacher labor markets, I think is a pretty new area for market design, policymakers are already shifting here. So in 2014, they announced the Education Educators for, uh, Excellent Educators for All initiative, which required all 50 states to submit plans for how they're going to guarantee equal access for all their students. And this is an opportunity for market designers to work with states to develop new, propose new ideas and to provide credible evidence about what the impact of these mechanisms actually is on student achievement and teacher quality. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>